and I'm Aaron Williamson. I'm the Open Source Readiness Lead here at Finnis. And uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Andrew Aiken, who is GM and uh, Global Open Source Practice Lead at Wipro Technologies. Andrew, take it away. All right. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Uh, so I, I definitely want to make this an interactive presentation. Please interrupt with questions or, or comments, and I'm happy to get additional input. Uh, the, the content today is, is really about how to uh, kind of triage your open source program, how to get your program on the right track so you can actually get to the important stuff, which is realizing the benefits of, of open source. And uh, I love feedback and input from the team. I, I'm not going to try and, and, and do this exhaustively. That's, that would be a, a good uh, full day conversation. But I want to really, really sat down and, and thought about, you know, over the few hundred engagements that myself and my team have done, what are some of the common lessons learned? What are some of the common experiences we've had? What are some, you know, what are some of the best practices that we've been able to extract from this? And wanted to share that. But <clears throat> Again, would love to get input from, from the people on the call. So I hope this is a, a bit of a, a two-way conversation. Uh, <clears throat> so briefly, let's see. Hold on just a second. I cannot seem to move from the first slide. There we go. Oops. So for those of you who don't know, uh, who Wipro is. We're one of the large global systems in integrators, um, over $8 billion in revenue, about 172,000 employees today, I believe, and <clears throat> over 1,000 active enterprise uh, class uh, clients. From an, uh, more relevant, from an open source perspective, we have well over 25,000 developers working on open, on using and working on open source projects. Uh, we're very, very active in the open source community, and, and that's growing. We're, we're deeply engaged in, in 20 uh, plus projects and foundations today, uh, and we've completed in the last couple of years over 1,000 uh, specific open source uh, projects, for, again, for large global enterprises. So we have a <clears throat> We have pretty good, uh, uh, pretty good focus on, on open source. We're the first uh, global systems integrator to actually instantiate an open source uh, dedicated practice. And so a lot of the information is, is coming from the lessons we've learned and the clients we've worked with in this context. There does seem to be a delay in moving slides. I'm not sure what that's about. There we go. So what are we, what are we really talking about today? This is the uh, technical definition of, of triage, assigning degrees of urgency to wounds or illnesses to decide the order of treatment. That's a little dramatic for our conversation, uh, uh, and I've extrapolated that really to, to what it means to, to me from an open source perspective. So it's really it's about defining and sequencing activities to determine and reduce the real and or perceived compliance and security issues related to the use of an undetermined amount and type of open source. And again, it's really that's to do, do all that in order to build and implement plans to realize the actual benefits of, of open source. So <clears throat> we're, we're focusing on financial services today. Most of the information that I'm going to share with you is related to our financial services clients that, we've work, work, that we're working with currently and over the last few years. And as we're probably aware, there's a huge amount of enthusiasm for open source in, in financial services. Uh, but there's also uh, a degree of, uh, in some cases, what I might call naivete or, or simply just a, a lack of, of experience or knowledge. And these are actual quotes that we've, we've gotten from, uh, that we've heard from our clients. Uh, again, to that point on enthusiasm, we have one client who said they wanted to <clears throat> open source a few dozen applications, and, but really didn't understand why we recommended they go look at GitHub first. <clears throat> at the end of the day, there was three or four of the applications that, that they uh, wanted to open source that hadn't almost been completely replicated within, within GitHub. Um, and one of the more interesting comments we've had is this application assesses, they're talking about, they're, this is a bank that is talking about an internal application that assesses the risk and impact of security vulnerabilities in all their other applications. And they were completely confident there was no open source in this application. It turned out they had 187 different open source components in that one. <clears throat> 
and, and my favorite is uh, we asked the community, and they're talking about sending a blanket email to an open source community. Uh, and they asked for an SLA and indemnification, and they really could not understand why no one replied to them. You know, we're XYZ Bank, this is a huge opportunity, we want to use the software, but we have to have an SLA and we have to have indemnification and, and nobody's replying to us. So again, there's a huge amount of enthusiasm for open source and financial services, but we still have uh, a bit of a ways to go to, to really uh, mature its use in financial services. All right, so we're talking, this, is, this can be kind of a complex issue, and, and, and we should talk a little bit about where open source comes from in an enterprise, in a financial services organization. How is open source ingested, essentially? What are the, the paths that open source gets into the organization? Well, a lot, of, uh, a lot of banks today are using community open source, some in production and, and, and some more in development. And they source that from communities, from foundations, from publicly available repositories. Uh, many, many of you use commercial open source. <clears throat> oh, and let me, let me finish that first one a little bit. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So community open source is mostly unvetted. And what I mean by that is it's, it's not necessarily uh, been, been, the code's not necessarily been scanned. <clears throat> there isn't necessarily a model by which they make sure that they're, they're, the software that they're developing is uh, free of their own IP issues or encumbrances. Uh, one of the challenges is uh, there's this notion of declared versus undeclared licenses. So a top level project will have a declared license. But what is very common is that developers will use other pieces of open source to create this piece of open source, and those other pieces of open source are under a different license, which may or may not be declared. So that's one of the challenges with, with community open source. Then we have commercial open source, which is mostly vetted uh, today, but not completely. If, if you're working with a lot of startups, they, they don't necessarily even understand that process. Uh, but it, commercial open source obviously comes with a ton of community open source. Then we have proprietary software. There's some great examples. <clears throat> if you look at SAP by their own, uh, by, by their own uh, designation, they use uh, open source in about 90% 90, 90 of the software they, they built. Uh, and, and the same can be said for Oracle or Microsoft or many other proprietary software vendors. So, uh, and again, there's a relationship between the size of the vendor and the uh, comprehensiveness of their own governance program. If you look at a Microsoft uh, or an SAP, they have very, very robust uh, governance and compliance programs in place. But again, as you, as you begin using software from smaller proprietary software vendors, you get a really mixed bag. And typically, proprietary software vendors provide software to you that includes community open source and in some instances third-party licensed commercial open source. Then we have Bespoke, <clears throat> mostly unvetted, you know, the, the software that, that you build or you contract to have built and, and it can also include community open source and commercial open source. Uh, and then software you acquire through your partners, whether they be independent software vendors or SIs like, like Wipro. Again, mixed vetting. Some have really good uh, uh, governance programs, uh, some don't, and it's, it's a challenge to know which unless you explicitly ask them. And again, that software will come with both community and commercial open source. Uh, in a study, oops, a study by White Source showed uh, uh, that the average Open, the average application today contains about 257 different uh, components, open source components. So if I, if I had a nickel for every time I heard from our clients, particularly I have to say in financial services, that they are a highly distributed organization and that our typical approach to helping them build a governance model wouldn't really be appropriate because they're so distributed, I, would, I could retire. Uh, yes, <clears throat> financial services organizations are very distributed and they are highly complex organizations. Uh, we understand that and, and the conversation typically goes that way we understand. We've built a model that helps you uh, 
uh, that helps address the distributed and, and complex nature of financial services organizations. And the typical response is, again, yes, but you don't really understand how distributed you are. We, we really are. Um, <clears throat> well, we've tried to take that into consideration. No, no, you don't understand. We're really, really, really distributed and, and complex, and so it's just not going to work. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, we get it. This is how a typical enterprise looks like. Um, if you can, if you put them on a, a maturity curve, where you have, you know, the, the lowest level of maturity is really open source is is brought in through ground up with few controls, uh, and it's it's ad hoc. Uh, you move all the way up the maturity curve to <clears throat> collaborate, where you're co-creating with the community to add additional business value to the organization, or even you're driving you're becoming a leader in the in the open source by publishing your own open source or contributing actively to, to communities. Uh, so every organization is on a maturity curve somewhere. Uh, and it's really important to understand that <clears throat> in, in your organizations, you will have different lines of business that are in different places on this, uh, on, on this maturity curve. You'll have functions. HR, legal, procurement that are on, uh, have different understandings or in different places on this maturity curve, and you have this. <clears throat> and some some organizations have this notion of a shared services group or a shared architecture group. And again, even within that, they will be within they will be on different uh, different at different stages of a, uh, a maturity curve. So <clears throat> this is this is a typical plot for uh, an average uh, enterprise today. So <clears throat> I want to discuss some, some common attributes of enterprises that are on this, uh, that, are, that are on this maturity curve. And these are some of the ones that, that we've really, some common aspects that we've been able to, to extract uh, from our experience. <clears throat> One of the key trends is that most organizations are recognizing that open source is becoming a strategic asset and not just a set of tactical components in your IT infrastructure and are beginning to think about how do we treat it that way. Um, there is uh, a uh, typically uh, enterprises do not understand how much open source they're using, where they're using it, or how they're using it. Uh, this is the numbers here I share are, are uh, from a, a recent engagement uh, where a client thought they had 200 components. Uh, they, they then did a quick internal analysis, found out they were using 400. Um, today, after working with them for a while, <clears throat> we're well over 4,000, and that number is probably going to continue to grow. So the, the average enterprise today is, is certainly using in the thousands uh, the, are the number of open source components. The main issue that we see <clears throat> is really around versioning. So in, in some organizations, well, one in particular, we found that they were using software that was 12 versions old. Uh, it's, it's really common, I would say, to find organizations that are using versions that are four to, you know, four to five versions old uh, with uh, uh, unpatched security fixes. That, in our experience, is really, at the end of the day, this is really the, the key issue. Uh, we find that some form of policy exists somewhere in the organization, uh, but typically it's, it's definitely not been uniformly implemented, neither has a process. Uh, and many organizations either have or are beginning to put together a program office. And one of, our, uh, one, of the, one of the things that we commonly notice is that HR procurement and the developers themselves are actually overlooked in, in an OSPO or open source program office. And these are, these are important people to engage in this process, particularly developers. And, and it's, it's really interesting that most organizations don't have this notion of a developer council or developer community with a representative into the open source program office. We definitely recommend that. So from a focus perspective, typically we see too much focus on intellectual property uh, issues. Yes, it has to be addressed. It's actually relatively straightforward to address. And at the end of the day, there, there really isn't too much concern around, uh, I mean, too much reality around IT leakage. Uh, we do see that there's too much or an appropriate level of focus on, on security. It depends where that's being driven from. Uh, but sometimes organizations focus so tightly on security that, again, they, they lose the overall benefit of, 
consuming more and more open source. Um, we do find typically an appropriate, appropriate focus on compliance. Uh, and in this instance, we're talking about license compliance. Uh, because for enterprises, it's not like uh, an OEM or someone manufacturing a handset who's distributing 100 different applications, mostly open source, on their handset to 100 million, uh, 100 million users. They have real, real, real compliance uh, con issues and concerns and liability. In the enterprise, it's less of an issue. Uh, and so we see that that, that is typically uh, fairly well governed. Um, we do see too little focus on operational aspects, and this is, this is really important because you're going to be using more and more open source over time. Uh, that's just a given, right? Open source is becoming more important to software overall, and therefore it's going to become more important to all of us. Uh, and so there, it's really important that not only do you put in place a governance program that protects you from licensing compliance and security issues, but a program that also addresses issues like how are you going to manage this over a period of time? How are you going to bring in more open source efficiently? How are you going to govern that open source efficiently? How are you going to update it? How is it going to be supported? <clears throat> so we really, really recommend that, that people spend a lot of time focusing on the operational aspects um, of open source. And we also see too little focus on ease of use, really, and this really comes to the, the, the process itself. So <clears throat> as we know, developers will look at any, anything that impedes their ability to write good quality software fast uh, as a burden, as another layer of bureaucracy. Um, and so we, we really recommend that you spend some time, you get the architecture teams together, you get the DevOps teams together, you, you get the legal team, uh, I mean, uh, the security teams together, and really think through how can this be most efficiently implemented to create the least additional burden to our developer community. So this, this bottom two we spend, we recommend you spend as much time thinking through as the rest or more. Uh, and we see uh, because of the, rise, the, the continued rise of open source in the enterprise, we, we definitely see a number of different, uh, when we get engaged with a, a client, a number of different disconnected activities. Uh, it, it, it's funny, as I was putting this together a few days ago, uh, it, it dawned on me that we're actually engaged with a client that has a DevOps activity going on, a shared, uh, shared services activity, central architecture activity going on. Um, a security activity going on and a legal one, all addressing various aspects of their own issues around open source and none of them were talking to each other or barely knew each other. So this is more common than, than might be expected. Any thoughts or, or comments here? Again, I'd, I'd like to make this a bit, bit of a two-way conversation. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, over the years, we've, we've really thought through what, what some of the core elements of good governance look like, uh, and, and we think of that from, from kind of two key aspects. Uh, one is, what are the core components? Well, the, 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 the core components of, of governance really boils down to three things. That's strategy, how, you know, defining the, the business rationale and objectives for why you're using open source and going through this whole exercise and investing the time and energy and funding to, to, do, to go through this process. Uh, policy, defining the rules, and then processes, again, how do we uh, effectively uh, implement automation into our DevOps, uh, our, our Dev environment to manage the use of open source on an ongoing basis. And then <clears throat> further, there are uh, seven key dimensions of, uh, 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 that make up kind of best practices around governance. It's how do you discover open source? How does that open source get approved? Uh, how is it commercially procured, uh, which, which, can, which includes supply chain management? Uh, how do we actually manage the code and maintain it? Uh, how do we engage with the open source community? Uh, what is our license compliance model? Uh, and do we have executive sponsorship? <clears throat> so all of these are, are really key aspects of your open source management strategy, your policy, and your processes. And each one is broken down into a variety of different uh, elements and aspects. But we look at it from the, the, to 
to have a successful program, it's important to take into consideration these, these seven dimensions of good governance. All right, so the first step really is about knowing where you are. <clears throat> And how do how do we recommend you you go about doing that? It's it's really start with a start with a survey. Uh, we recommend the survey be cross functional. Recommend that it be multiple choice to offer response respondents a a way. To, the, the the aspect of having something be multiple choice gets the respondents to think about the question itself in more detail. So what we found, rather than providing a you know kind of a binary answer. Uh, and I'll give an example in, in just a slide here. Uh, and we also recommend that it, that it be anonymous or offer to be anonymous. Uh, the, uh, you know, we've looked at this pretty carefully and the difference, particularly in the next step, the, the direct interview process be, between offering to be anonymous and, and uh, surveys that are not, don't have that option. The, the depth and quality of information and feedback is in some instances, substantially greater. Okay, so step two <clears throat> is really doing qualitative interviews, identifying key stakeholders, which include people from the different functions I, I mentioned earlier, uh, and <clears throat> identifying key stakeholders and, and going through a, a actual person-to-person -person interview uh, process and addressing qualitative aspects uh, of open source usage. Uh, and then the last, the last step to really rounding out your, your view of, uh, your internal view of, of where you are today is really going through uh, a baseline set of scanning. So Greenfield and legacy scans to really get a picture of where you are today. Um, and the last part is uh, you need to de determine which applications to put in your, your sample uh, scans to develop the baseline. Uh, not necessarily let a vendor select those uh, <clears throat> because they, they won't necessarily have the insights into your application portfolio uh, and the attributes of your applications that, that you do. So we recommend that, again, you as the, as the end user of these applications determine which ones should be, should be included in, in a baseline scan. Mm -hmm. Andrew, I have a question here. I've, I've had a question from, our, from various participants in this program um, before, mm -hmm. sort of how to choose um, or how to go about deciding which applications within the sort of legacy portfolio to scan first um, and sort of how to plan out, you know, how you go through your backlog of applications and, and do that scanning and remediation. <clears throat> sure. Well, a few of them are probably obvious, such as anything that's customer facing you want to do, you want to pick a few of your more complex customer facing applications. Uh, those applications where customers may be inputting personal data, obviously uh, you, you want to see what the, what, what the issues, if there are issues around uh, open source and privacy. So that's, that's one set. Uh, if you're moving to <clears throat> a cloud native architecture, in other words, you're going through an internal transformation. Uh, we recommend picking some of those apps that have already been uh, transformed, as it were, and have become uh, cloud hosted. Uh, definitely scan a few of those, and then pick some of the older, uh, <clears throat> pick some of the older legacy applications where you're storing any kind of customer data. Also, uh, it, it doesn't it, to do a sample baseline scan. You may want to make sure that that you're covering your lines of business. You want to make sure you're covering customer facing applications and those legacy applications that again contain a lot uh, or any customer data. That's kind of a, a cut at which ones to pick. And it doesn't have to be, you know, we're not saying you put together a list of 40 different applications. You, you, I don't think you need that many. It can be, depending upon the size and, and complexity of the application, it can be six, eight applications. Okay, so this is sort of a cross section of your enterprise. It really is important to get a cross section. And at the end of the day, you may make the decision that you're going to let your legacy portfolio uh, be alone uh, and not try and, and scan everything and, uh, and, and remediating it. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's just something you have to determine. I would say probably 25% of our clients want to get everything scanned and 75% are 
just focusing on new greenfield applications and, and customer data and, and customer data applications that, that contain customer data and letting the older legacy applications uh, go. Then once you've done this, the, the survey, we recommend taking a, it, it's, it's important to, to help visualize the, the uh, where you are today and be able to convey that visually to the people within the organization. So it's, you know, recommend putting together some form of a chart. It doesn't have to be a spider chart, but this is uh, output from an actual uh, client uh, that worked with a while ago, and it shows where they are uh, on managing these the different aspects or the, def the different dimensions of, of open source governance. So uh, they need to expand. We, we don't necessarily say you have to have uh, you have to cover that entire circle, uh, but you should be farther out than this organization is. You should certainly be farther into the green and blue. Uh, sometimes trying to reach uh, that that last stage is simply not it, it's it's not necessarily what you're trying to achieve as an organization to be and to to become an absolute leader and driver and visible. Uh, member of the open source community, that may not be your corporate goals, but your goals are to consume relevant open source and to contribute back and, and maybe occasionally publish your own, and that's fine. So setting your goals on, on, on getting out to the, the green and the blue is, can be perfectly acceptable. So this is an example of, of a type of question we recommend in, in the survey that you should do. So again, this, go, this is how do developers in your organization find and source open source. Uh, and in ours, we actually have about six or seven more pieces to this, this one question. And what you're really trying to do is by providing it as, as multiple choice here is get your developers, this is a part of the acculturation process, is getting your developers and, and any of the respondents to think about how we're using open source in your organization, why we're using open source. It's, it, you've got to realize that you want to ask, you want to survey people who really have not thought about this. You want to make sure you're, you're not, you're not self-selecting your most knowledgeable audience. You're trying to get broader than, you're trying to get input, input which is broader than that. You want to go beyond your, uh, your open source leaders in the organization. You want to go beyond your attorney who's an open source expert or your chief architect who's, who's an open source expert or, uh, you know, people of that type. You want to get, broaden it to those who use open source but don't really think about it too much. Okay? And so by giving them a, a multiple choice uh, a question, it helps them begin to think through that in a bit more detail. So these are aspects of open source governance, which we find are often overlooked. Uh, if, if some of you are going through this list and saying, hey, we've incorporated every one of these elements in our governance program, awesome. Congratulations, kudos to you. Uh, but this is that, you, and you can be proud that you're not typical. You're definitely on, you know, on the forward edge of, of uh, good governance. But again, these are typical elements that are, de that are definitely over, uh, often overlooked, and I'm going to go through a, a few of them. So <clears throat> build a business justification model. It's not only, this isn't uh, only just for your overall enterprise-wide strategy, but this is kind of a, a, a decision tree type of approach that you can make available to developers who want to either consume more open source or contribute or publish your own open source. So make it easy for them to figure out if it makes sense. And, and this can be something as uh, as simple as an, as a web-based survey with you know eight or nine or ten different questions. But <clears throat> build a, a model that helps developers think through that process and helps make it easy for your program office or other leadership to make a decision on these uh, on whether or not to do something related to do something in open source here. Um, Clearly define your operating model and your, your own version of internal best practices and, and describe why that's important to the organization uh, because what you're doing is you're beginning to create uh, your own open source culture. Um, as we know, many organizations today are trying to become more, more of a tech company for a variety of reasons and they view open source as a catalyst to do so. Um, and that 
process of transformation is really the technology, the tools, frankly, that's the easy part. As we know, it's, it's really the cultural change that's most difficult. So as a part of your govern of building a good governance model, begin to define what your best practices are and, uh, and align that with your existing culture and then think through how you can use open source technologies or open source methods to begin to change your culture and build a training program. Many enterprises and financial services organizations really give this short shrift. Build a, a fairly de detailed training program on the basics of open source, uh, why it's important to your organization. Don't overlook that because you, the more you share with your, with your developer community and other stakeholders why you're doing this, the easier it is for them to, to buy into it. Uh, make this available uh, as a part of HR onboarding uh, for new people. Make it available as a, as a survey or a fun test online for your existing developer community. Uh, don't, don't ignore this piece. Um, <clears throat> one of the first things that's important to do is uh, align on risk. So every organization has a slightly different risk tolerance. And it, within a distributed organization, as, as, we, as, we, as I showed earlier, different groups within the organization will have different views on risk and what that means to, to the uh, company as a whole. So one of the things we, we really highly recommend is one of the first things you should do is align across the organization on what level of risk you are comfortable in taking when it comes to open source. Uh, also, it's amazingly overlooked, uh, the notion of defining what success, not only to, is success is, is, is two metrics here, is, is two dimensions here. One is success of our governance program. What, what does success look like for us? Are we going to get to 90%? Uh, uh, are we gonna, uh, our target is going to be uh, understanding 90% of the open source we use in the organization? Are we going to try and get higher than that? Uh, is success to standardize, you, you can get down to granular levels of successes. We're going to discover all the open source databases we're using, and over time we're going to try and get that down to just five, you know, for example. Uh, define success of the overall, of your overall open source strategy. That's really important to do early on. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, because again, a governance program is something that you need to do so that you can get to realizing the actual benefits of open source. So define what those benefits are to you. It's different organizations have different types of, of definitions of success. Uh, engage your developers in this whole process. <clears throat> we recommend creating a kind of a self-selected developer council or community and have them elect a representative to be a part of the governance, uh, governance process. Um, define internal and external communication policies so there are good best practices around how you communicate internally uh, and externally. Think through, uh, you know, if you have to issue a legal missive on <clears throat> open source and risk and compliance and security and so on, make sure that it's, it's reviewed by a number of different people to, uh, so that it's tailored for the audience. Uh, simple things like that. <clears throat> Uh, also, many organizations look at, at governance and compliance from purely an internal perspective. They look at the <clears throat> they, they look at the the software that they're consuming from open source sources, but they're not necessarily looking at the software that they're that they're ingesting from third party sources. That's uh, again frequently missed uh, missed here, and so we definitely recommend that that be a part of the process. You have, it, it's really important to understand what software. Uh, what open source is in the software that you are consuming from your third-party vendors, other ISVs or, or SIs like, like Wipro. Um, and you should have a form, a way of tracking that, whether it's using some of the, the resources out there like, like OpenChain or SPDX, which allow you to create a standard bill of materials. And you can say, hey, here's what we need to know about open source before We'll buy it from you. Please produce this bill of materials for us so we know exactly what's in your software. Uh, and then engage HR and procurement in the process. Uh, this is, again, something that's, that's mostly overlooked. They're, they're, they're added as, <clears throat> essentially, they're, uh, they're added as an after, uh, as 
what's the word I'm looking for? They're, they're added to this process at the tail end. They're, they're essentially notified of the governance model and program as opposed to being a part of constructing it. Uh, this is important for HR uh, to be a part because we, we've probably all heard of this notion of frozen middle. Uh, as open source becomes more and more uh, standard in your enterprise, you have the developers that, that get it, they want to use it more and more. You have executives that are beginning to see what their peers are doing in open source and in some instances issuing edicts, hey, we're an open source first company. But it's that, fro it's that group in the middle that one, they're paid for stability and predictability and reliability and for resisting change. Right, so you've got this pressure coming from the bottom, from the top, and the, gut, and the people in the middle are, are in many, not always obviously, but in many instances kind of resisting that because that's not their job. Um, and so if you engage HR, you can begin to think through how do we change, how do we incentivize that, that uh, middle group, the middle management layer to, to actually begin to incorporate and embrace open source and help in the governance process. So I'm going to finish up here with, with a recommended set of, of kind of sequencing or how we recommend you, you go about thinking how to implement the governance program and, and open source strategy overall. So <clears throat> we've been talking a little bit about, about triage here. Uh, that's typically the, the, the first step. We know that many of you are going through that process and it can take a, a bit of time, but you, you should also, as you begin to think about your governance model, think about, okay, we have to do, typically there's a sense of urgency to understanding how much open source we're using today. Are there security, are there, gov are there a license or IP issues? Let's get that fixed. Let's move it into then a steady state. Let's move it in let's, and let's make sure that we, we're kind of defining that change from addressing this from an, from an immediate perspective to moving it into a steady state governance model. Okay. Then we recommend along with this triage process that you begin to drive internal alignment at the different levels of the organization, at the developer, at the mid-management, at the executive level with the different functions, HR, procurement, legal. You, it's important to, as early as possible, get internal alignment on what your risk tolerance is, what your overall strategy is, how, you how you're defining success in the organization. That should be an exercise that started off really, uh, at the very beginning stage. Uh, then, it, it, as you begin to get a hold of, of where you are and what open source you're using, you're beginning to drive internal alignment. Okay, and now it's time to really begin to, to think about your enterprise-wide open source strategy. What is that strategy? What's the business rationale and justification? What are the success metrics for the different aspects of strategy? Uh, and then think through how you're going to actually implement that across the organization. As you begin to think through that, a, part, a key part of it is community engagement. And, and uh, when I say community, community engagement in this context, it's very broad. It's how do we, con how do we engage with communities? How, we, how do we contribute back to communities? Which foundations should we be, be a part of? Uh, what resources are we going to allocate to our community engagement model? Uh, how is that going to be governed? Uh, if we're going to open source something, uh, what resources are necessary to, to apply to that. Uh, <clears throat> because today, if you, if, you look in, uh, if you look across the top 10 banks in the world, today they have about 5,000 projects on GitHub, and that's growing exponentially. Uh, but of those 5,000 projects, maybe 100 are actually vibrant and viable. So it's really important to, to have a a clear, well thought out plan that if you're going to open source something, uh, make sure that you're allocating the right level of, of resources uh, and making the right level of, of commitment to make that project successful, which will help you stand out in the, in the very crowded field. In the last process, <clears throat> the last thing we recommend is to start the, the kind of organizational and cultural um, process relatively early here. Uh, bringing open source into your organization, uh, accruing the benefits of, of open source is really a lot about changing culture. And so the, the earlier you begin to do that, the better. And of course, that is an ongoing process. All right. So I've, <clears throat> I've thrown a lot out there uh, today. This, this is, uh, you know, our, our recommendation is going through a governance, going through a, building a governance model 
is a little bit like building the first piece of software. So it's really hard to write that first piece of software. And, but you can't get to that, you can't get to that economy of scale unless you go through that, that those first few hard steps. Uh, and because if you think about it, releasing that second, that second piece of software is so much easier once you've gone through that in the third and the fourth and the fifth and the 10th and the hundredth is so much easier once you've gone through the hard work of getting that the software built the first time. So this is a, a little bit of our experiences and in, in our lessons learned. Any other Great, thoughts, comments, you. questions? I'm sorry, I missed that. Was that? Uh, I, I was saying thank you, Andrew. Um, I think it was a very enlightening presentation. Um, but yes, uh, any questions from the from the audience? Yes, hi, hi, Andrew. It's Sally here. I have a question. Um, so, where we are purchasing um, something from a third party, and with regards to the bill of materials that we are requesting mm -hmm. from them. How realistic is it for us to expect them to provide us with a list of the open source licenses associated to their embedded components, um, confirming that they comply with the license terms and conditions, confirming that they will address identified security vulnerabilities in their software products, and also requesting that, that they indemnify our company in the event any breach of license terms and conditions occurs. How realistic, um, mm -hmm. uh, in relation to development executed by them, mm -hmm. is that realistic for us to expect that they agree to, to those terms and conditions or, or, or our requirements? We're, we're expecting that that's the case for new software that we're purchasing. Mm -hmm. These are the sort of guidelines, mm -hmm. rules that we're going to implement in via our procurement process. So I just need, just wanted to understand your view on, on our expectations. Sure. Uh, well, and you asked a few questions in there. Let me break it down a little bit. So first off, <clears throat> there is, there is a, a direct relationship between the size uh, and nature of the organization you're buying the software from. If you ask for this from IBM and, and SAP and, and organizations like that, yeah, they'll be able to do it. Uh, and it, it, it wouldn't be too much of an issue. But as you go down, there is a direct relationship as you go in using down into mid-level software event, software providers down to startups, uh, they, they will have, many of them don't understand what software they're using themselves to make, in their own, right? Uh, and it's, it's, right, so today it's, it's very typical that uh, they understand what their software does, but they don't necessarily understand everything that, that makes up that secret sauce. Um, so what we've seen some organizations do is, <clears throat> and many of them have not scanned their own software, so they can't produce that bill of materials for you. Uh, some organizations we've seen actually offer that, uh, some enterprises like yourself offer that as a, uh, to, they'll say, we have a recommended vendor who does the scanning, please work with them, they'll do it with you. Uh, and it will be, and, and sometimes if the software is important, some enterprises pay for that. Sometimes they push that back on, on the software vendor. That's, that's kind of mixed. Um, mm. But that's a part of what we recommend is, is whomever your preferred uh, vendor is, uh, having an agreement with them that they will audit uh, third-party suppliers at your request, which typically isn't a hardship for them to do so. Uh, <clears throat> so that's one way around it. And then the indemnification issue is, is a bit harder. Uh, many startups will, will provide high levels of indemnification because they're not, not particularly worried about ever having to, to adhere to it. You know, if there's kind of an issue, it's, it, if an issue, whether it's an IP or license or compliance issue, <clears throat> comes up that's uh, particularly, uh, you know, that's particularly egregious, like, like it's, it's actually a, a real issue, uh, then it, you're not going to be the only one that has it. 
with them. Uh, whomever else they provided that software to will also have the issue. And at the end of the day, no one's going to collect anything from a startup. I mean, you really, at the end of the day, you really don't have a lot of recourse. Uh, and so, again, we recommend that, that enterprises have a uh, have an approach for particularly those, those startups that they're working with that anticipates the fact that, one, they don't know the software and they don't know themselves, but they don't know what's in their software at the end of the day, and they don't know how to go about identifying that. So you can make it easy on them with just a little bit of work and say, please work with our recommended vendor. They'll help you produce the bill of materials. Uh, we can address it after that. Okay, thank you. I mean, obviously that's, that, that's helpful just to, to, to understand that, that we may, um, you know, come across some, a challenge with, you know, according to the size of the, of the company uh, and the vendor that, mm -hmm. that we're engaging with and that startups may need a little bit more work mm -hmm. or, or some back and forth negotiation. So that's really helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure, and, and we've seen, and last piece on that, if they're a venture-backed startup, with a really cool hot technology that, that you're looking at for whatever reason, uh, many VCs require, uh, before they'll write a check, they, they require to understand what's in, in the code. So, uh, and that's actually, you know, fairly common today. So they may actually have, uh, it just depends on how recent that, that scan is. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Andrew, you mentioned training, um, and I know that's something that uh, a lot of our members are sort of focused on right now. Um, can you can you give a brief overview on on sort of you know who who you deliver or you know who enterprises should be focused on delivering open source related training to? Does that training vary across roles? Um, you know, how do you get started on, on producing a useful training program? Uh, so it, it will vary across roles, but there is always uh, or, or should be a, a kind of lowest common denominator in open source 101 and, and 201 that everyone who will be touching open source in some way, shape or form should go through and, and demonstrate uh, reten knowledge retention essentially. Um, and that'll be, uh, you know, the basics, the fundamentals, uh, uh, essentially a layman's understanding of what open source is, what copyleft is, where it is today, why it's important uh, from an industry perspective, why it's important to that particular whatever organization it is. Um, so we definitely recommend, and that's the easiest way to get started in building a training program is, is creating those, you know, one or two levels of lowest common denominator uh, knowledge. Uh, we definitely recommend that it, that the web-based, I mean, that almost goes without, without saying today, web-based, that it have, uh, I don't like the word tests, but it, it, it really, you, you want to understand that, you do want to know that everyone's gone through it uh, and has a basic understanding of it. There are certainly ways to almost gamify the, the training, uh, make it fun, make it, make it, uh, uh, not not uh, burdensome, and then <clears throat> the, the training should be modular. So you have a module for legal, module for HR, module for procurement, module for developers, for security, so on. A lot of them will have a lot of these different modules will have uh, also very similar, very kind of a similar baseline, but then there'll be specifics to that particular role and function. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I guess on that same topic, how, how deep do you want to go in, in your training program on the sort of specifics of your own implementation of an open source program, or, you know, do you leave that stuff for uh, documentation? <laughs> that, that's uh, actually a good, good question and an important nuance. Uh, <clears throat> we, th we think for certain communities within organizations such as developers, it's important to go fairly deep, and the reason why you do that is, is not only because you want to make sure that they're understanding uh, how to comply, the process for complying with your uh, open source 
um, program, but also, again, it's, it's a bit of, um, it, it helps to get them embedded, helps to get them bought in to the process, which is really important. I mean, we, we, we as a community really need to focus on making sure that we're enabling developers and that we're, we're reducing the overhead or burden to them as much as possible. And so being open, transparent, and engaging them in the process is one of our strongest recommendations, and that includes training. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, if anyone wants to, to reach out with any specific questions, uh, you know, please feel free to do so. Uh, and if anyone has some comments they want to share, I know we have a mixture on the call of, of end users and, and vendors. Uh, love to get your feedback and, and input. Uh, you know, is there something critical, something that, that you feel is really important that, that uh, I might have overlooked today, you know, please feel free to share it and, and we'll also make the, obviously the slides available. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Andrew. I really appreciate your uh, preparing this and presenting it to the group.